Okay, so we had some technical issues and we had to go old school with this interview and I just had to use my phone. I couldn't figure out what was going on. I couldn't get the camera, the real setup to work. I think it turned out it was my headphones. That's why I couldn't hear anything. Got these other headphones on now to do the intros and outros. Uh, but the interview turned out great. Phil Susan is here to promote the latest album with his super group, Last in Line. It's called Jericho and it comes out March 31st. Single is called Ghost Town. It's out now. And I'm going to pick Phil's brain on success of the people that he's worked with. And we talk a little bit about his time with Ozzy, Vince Neil, Janie Lane, and more. Stick around. So sorry about that. Uh, kind of embarrassing, but I'm sure you know technical difficulties. You probably have stories about that, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> with recording or touring or both you know shit happens i mean all the time the more technology you have the more there is to go wrong and uh it's supposed to make life easier but i'm sometimes i wonder <laughs> seriously i know it's like right? well when it's working it's like amazing you're like oh my god i'm doing these amazing things the internet is so lightning fast and i'm able yeah. to talk to you I don't know. Are you in LA or Vegas? Where are you? Uh, I'm in Vegas at the moment. Okay. So yeah, I mean, we're able to have a conversation video and it's pretty crystal clear. That's pretty amazing. So yeah. Yeah. So tell me about the, the, the new album here. This is the third one for last in line, right? Yep. It sure is. It's uh, it's the third record. And uh, you know, when, when I originally came in to fill in for a few shows for, for the, lately departed um, Jimmy Bain. I mean, the idea was just really to finish, you know, some commitments for some shows that were in place. And um, I don't know that any of us really thought this was any more than that. But as we started working together, we realized that we had a uh, a terrific chemistry and uh, a great bunch of guys who, who all sort of complemented each other. And we decided, you know what, this is sort of growing legs, so to speak. So, um, you know, the decision was made to, well, let, let's record, let's move forward and let's see what happens. And that's pretty much uh, what, what has happened. That's what we've done. And that's where we are here at a third record. So, you know, in this yeah. business, Chuck, it's really strange because, I mean, you can do everything right. And um, the outcome is never is never guaranteed. Um, it's not like fixing a car. You know, if you do the right thing just when you fix a car, you know, it's going to work. Right. <laughs> Or at least in theory, but um, with the, with with our business, you, you never know. I mean, it's and so when all of a sudden something works and develops attraction, um, it the, the sensible thing to do is to put your weight behind it and say, well, okay, this let, let's push this forward now. This is working through whatever maybe planets have to align a certain way. I don't know what it is, but you know, all of a sudden something was working with this band, and we decided to to continue moving forward. So. Yeah. Do you, now, are you happy with the results of the first? Well, let's see. Do you were you there on the first record or no? This, when did you join? No, no, I joined right before the first record was released. Okay. So, are you happy with like with the progression of the band and the and the results of the? Because a lot, a lot of bands go, that's ah, not worth it to make a record. Um, I mean, I don't know financially if it is, but I mean, I feel like artistically, just as an artist, I would want to make music. I wouldn't want to just play the songs live. I'd want to create new things. Well, of course. I mean, that was always the intention of the band. I mean, we 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 wrestled for a long time with this this uh, uh, idea that we were a Dio cover band or tribute band or a heritage band or whatever you want to call it. And there is one out there, the Dio Disciples. That's what they do. Yeah, we never did that. I mean, we sure there were some songs that if we didn't play, <laughs> we'd probably get lynched. But um, they were really placeholders for new material. And as we've um, you know, developed our new material, we've slowly phased out a lot of those songs and brought in our own, which has been very well received. I mean, that was really the acid test. You know, I remember when we played Download um, in 2019, um, and the debate was, well, what songs should we play? I mean, we have a limited amount of time. Should we play how many, which of the Dio songs should we play? And I forget who it was. It might, might well have been me. <laughs> you know, somebody had an idea and said, hey, what do you think if we just don't play any Dio stuff? And uh, everyone sort of shrugged and went, yeah, well, at least it'll answer the question. If we can get through this, I mean, if it doesn't, then we know what, we're, what we are. And if, and if it does, 
that, that'll be great. And and pretty much, I, I, I don't think we played any Dio songs apart from one encore. Um, but it went down like a storm. It was fantastic. It was very well received. And I thought that spoke volumes as to um, whether people were enjoying the new material or not. I wanted to hear it. Yeah, well, it's, it sounds like it's kind of designed to play live. Like, just the, uh, because you've got the, uh, it's a super group, really. I mean, the musicians in there, you guys are all great. It's, it's great guitar riffs and amazing solos. And then you got the cool bass lines and then the drum beats and, and the screaming vocals. I mean, it all sounds, there's no weak links in this band. So it sounds like it would be amazing to hear live. It is. It translates live very, very well. Um, in fact, uh, people have said that it's, uh, that sometimes the recordings don't do it justice. Um, there's definitely an excitement in what we do live. I don't know about the sound. I can't tell you. Couldn't tell you. But as far as what we do, there there is an excitement. You can tell. It's it's electric when we play, and people people are, are magnetized. You know, they don't go to the bathroom when we play a new song. Um, and so, um, you know, that 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 again, it's 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 an energy. We we're all together in this room. You, we can feel the energy, and they can feel the energy. And we're part of the same, the same, you know, the same machine. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, when I look at, you know, people say sometimes, you know, are you happy with the way it's gone or the album or whatever? Um, I think I am. I, well, I don't think I am. I know I am very happy with it because that's the natural way that it was going to go. And so when you bring together a bunch of influences that are all slightly different and you put them in a room together, but they have a certain... Um, you know, musical respect for each other. I think, you know, wonderful things happen, great things happen. So, you know, that's, that's, that's sort of what's where the, where, where the progression of these albums has gone. It started with a sort of DNA that was Dio. And certainly that last record, I mean, I was a big fan of Jimmy's. I was a good friends. We were very good friends. Um, and, uh, I mean, we used to live together. <laughs> so it's, we were close pals and I have so much respect for Jimmy and he was, um, but he has a different set of influences from mine. And so there's naturally going to be a, a, a different shift to the to the boat, to the boat's course a little bit. You know, I'm going to shift it more in my direction and you're going to get something that's unique. But it is a natural evolution. I mean, we haven't sat down there and said, mm, that's what sort of songs should we write for this next record? We just sit in a room and we say, we won't bring anything in. Let's just plug in and see what happens. And eventually we'll play something and somebody will say, oh, I like that. OK, we'll, and then we'll start with that. And so it's a it's very organic. So that's the songwriting process. It's kind of you're all yeah. in the room together. It's not like you bring a song and then people tweak it. No, no. In fact, <laughs> when I first when we first decided that we should go and start recording some more material um, a few years ago now, um, I think I called Viva and I said, hey, I'll dig through some ideas, see if I can get some 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 bits and pieces to bring in, so we've got some stuff to jam on. He went, no, 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 that's not how we do this. Um, ever since the Dio days, the way we did it was to sit in a room and just see what happens. And so he suggested that we do the same again. So don't bring anything in. We'll just plug in and, and see what happens. And hmm. I remember I got there early, and uh, uh, Vinny was there, and we started jamming on this idea, and, and it was a uh, I can't remember which song it was. It ended up end up one of the songs on two. Uh, it just came together, it just happened, and so that's how, that's how we write. And it's so refreshing now, Chuck. That I don't know if I can go into the old kind of paradigm of sitting there with a band and going, "Okay, well, here's my demos, here's my demos," and then we all sit there and listen to them and say, "We'll work on that. We'll work on that," which is almost like a, you know, it's like a combination of four or solo projects. You know, people bringing in finished songs and really that's not the best way to do this in a band the best way to do it in a band is to come up with stuff together yeah well that's amazing you guys can all be in the same spot because that's an issue too with a lot of bands you know that you have members in different states or cities or countries and so it's hard to get together so then you try to do it on zoom which as we know doesn't always work out so great so it's much easier to be in the same room it's well it's it we don't we have that situation as well we've got you know viv who lives in new hampshire I, I, andy and i live in in Vegas, I live between LA and Vegas, um, and Vi uh, Vinny lives in uh, like towards San Diego, Southern California. So we are far away, but what it means is that when we do 
have make an effort to get together. It's usually for a limited amount of time, but we're tremendously focused because we know that we've got to come up with something because if we don't, uh, you know, sometimes I wonder if you have, you know, I've worked on projects where you've had two or three weeks to do something. Nothing really gets done until about two days before the end of the, to, before the deadline. So why not just show up for those two days and just do it, you know, uh, but it, when we do it, we only have a, sh a short amount of time. So we do have to take full advantage of the time. So how many days was this? This wasn't two days, though, was it? No, I mean, we originally went to cut uh, a couple of songs back in January of, I don't remember anymore, this pandemic really screwed me up. Was it January two, 2020, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that would have been before the pandemic, yeah. Right. So January, two months before the pandemic, <clears throat> we met up in uh, LA and we went to a studio with a view to just cut two tracks that we'd been playing around with. We just thought, eh, maybe we'll do something. And surprise, surprise, after three days, we'd cut, we'd cut six tracks. And fortunately, we had those basic tracks to work on during the pandemic. When it started to open up a little bit more, <clears throat> excuse me, when it, everything started to open up a little bit more, then we went into a studio here in Vegas and we cut six more tracks. But we, we worked very quickly. I mean, we did those in um, probably two, three or four day writing sessions. Okay. Yeah, so is there, I noticed like some, is there some biblical kind of themes on this record? Like, you know, there's a the song, Not Today, Satan. And then there was uh, the song, uh, Walls of Jericho, which I think Jericho is, you know, one of the oldest cities. There's some biblical stuff about that. And there was, I think there was another song, and I forget which one it was, where something about Jesus, I was like trying to figure out I, I I didn't know if that was just yeah. coincidental or not at all. In fact, it's um, uh, um, I I don't know where Andrew came up with "Not Today, Satan," but he heard it somewhere and and he thought it was a it might have been one of those kind of Game of Thrones type of things or something. And uh, uh, you know, he 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 wanted to uh, do that, uh, you know, write those lyrics. Um, however. You know, as I started to listen to the whole record, um, to me it was all about. I mean, there was a lot of conflict going on on this on this album. There's a lot of challenges, and 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 really, they're challenges that we've experienced. We've all experienced yourself included, everybody in these last two or three years. It's been really trying. I mean, there's been tragedies, disasters, inconveniences. I mean, it's so much stuff. You know, the 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 division that goes on in this world. I mean, everything is just is just a challenge. And it just seems that if you can get through this, that there's got to be something on, better on the other side. And for me, that's what Jericho meant. Jericho meant breaking down the walls of whatever it is and you know, moving forward to something much, much better and being able to overcome all of these things, which is why the, the, the artistic imagery on the album has the same thing. It has all these you know, demons and influences and all this crazy shit that's going on, but it's not religious. It's just more of a, just wanted to, you know, maybe good and evil and just trying to get through it all. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything we do tries to have, we try to have a po positive message. The last album, you know, it was were, was a, a similar set of challenges, I think, but the, the last record, the last song on the record is called The Light. I mean, it's not religious. It's just that at the end of the tunnel, there's a light. <laughs> there is a light. You know, you have to, you have to believe that because if you don't, then what's the point? Mm -hmm. You've got to believe. You've got to be. Uh, um, you've got to believe that that's at the end of, of all our struggles. There's a benefit to it, and whatever that happens to be is is up to each individual person. Huh. But, you know, I like to be try to try to sort of give people a positive. I like. I, I personally like to sort of empathize with people with what they're going through. I like to try to relate with people with what they're going through. But I also like to bring a positive message and say, Hey, look, you know. It's worth it. It's mm -hmm. worth it. Maybe you don't know right now, but someday you look back and you realize it's all worth it. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, it's just because it's like there's like there's some of that satanic imagery stuff is coming back. I don't know if you saw the Grammys and there was controversy with that. And then it made me think of the 80s. Like obviously you played with Ozzy and there was that whole thing like that, you know, people were burning records and things. And so it seems like that people are on kind of high sensitivity about saint satanic imagery again and i was like i was just thinking i was like oh that's interesting because it's I feel like that's something that nobody really cared about and then all of a sudden it's kind of like back in a way it's kind of interesting 
yeah, you look at death metal and all of that stuff. I mean, what we did with Ozzy was laughable. I mean, you know, move forward about 10 years and, uh, um, uh, you know, what we did was so, uh, I don't know, trivial because all of a sudden, I mean, I, I don't know if you, you remember any of this stuff, but there was this huge uh, controversial thing about the Ultimate Sin album cover because in the foreground, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, was it uh, Vallejo? The guy, the artist who painted it, hmm. had little tiny, tiny crosses, like crucifixes, crosses in the foreground. And we had to take them out. Oh, you can't have that there. No, 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 you can't possibly have it. You couldn't have a, a, a Julie Gray, the model that was on the cover, couldn't have a crack in her ass. There was a crack painted, they had to airbrush it. <laughs> And we had to do this to to satisfy all of this 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 stuff, and um, uh, but uh, you know move forward about ten years, and all of a sudden it was just like, you know, dragging out corpses, and, and I don't know, it just got really dark. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know that we we're being religious or anything. I mean, Satan to us is just to to me. I mean, it's just it's just stuff that's bad, as opposed to stuff that's good. You know, it doesn't. You know, you want to give it a name. It's an influence if you want. If, but uh, no, it's. I, I hope it's not interpreted as something preachy or religious or anything like that. It's just not. It's just something that's supposed to be very easily uh, related to. That's all. Yeah, well, I think that's what music is uh, in general. I think all music. I mean, most music brings people together mm-hmm. from different, all different backgrounds. They're like, hey, we all like this you know this band we all like this song like how many people of all different kinds of backgrounds like heavy metal like tons and so you can go to a concert and see all sorts of different people it's interesting you know that's one thing you all have in common yeah you know it's um it's it is true and you you i mean you know you bring up religion and stuff and religion to me is extremely personal i think you know everybody's religious viewpoints are completely 100 percent valid but they are personal it's people's personal you know thing that that they get out of it and and whether it's somebody who's a maybe it's a somebody who's a agnostic who just believes in fate maybe it's somebody who who's, who who believes in a, a some kind of religion maybe somebody who has their own philosophy on life or their own philosophy and wants to deal with things but you, know, you have to have some language that kind of joins um the, you know the, the 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 good desirable things from those things that we're trying to get over um challenges you know, one person may have, you know, personal challenges of uh, maybe alcohol challenges or drug challenges or personality disorders or whatever thing that somebody has that they're trying to strive to get over. Um, you know, we, we, we all have our challenges. Um, and freedom is really is, is, is getting away from those things that sort of, you know, hold you down, bad habits, whatever it happens to be. Yeah, well, you mentioned that. That's interesting because uh, I was going to ask. I know we don't have a lot of time, um, but I did. I, I've heard some other interviews, and I've heard you obviously you've talked about Ozzy a lot in, in your time with that. But I've never heard you talk about your work with uh, Jamie Lane. Did you tour with him, or did you actually sit down and do songwriting with him? Because I always thought he was a really underrated songwriter. Oh, Jamie was the best. What a great songwriter, great guy, amazing singer, great front man. I mean, I, I miss him dearly. He was just somebody, one of my favorite people. And yes, he was an incredible songwriter. And he was a great musician, too. He was a drummer as well. I don't know if you know that. But um, but I, yes, I toured with him. I toured with him in the latter part of his career when he had a solo band. And uh, we had different people. Uh, uh, Mike Fazzano played drums. And uh, um, um, we had just first, uh, he found uh, Dario Lorena, who's now playing with the uh, Black Label Society. Well, Janie found him. So he's a, we first gave him a gig. He was about seventeen wow. years old or something. So, That's but, cool. Yeah. Hi, do you like playing with all these guys, Ozzy and Janie Lane and Vince Neil and Billy Idol? Is there one like thing when you look at their success that brings them all together? Like, is it is it just their raw talent? They just have so much raw talent. Is there work ethic? Is it something else? Is it timing? Like, how did those guys become so big? You got to be around them and watch them work. Uh, I honestly don't know. I mean, it has, it comes from something that, you know, having some kind of spark at the right time. Um, I mean, all of these people that you mentioned had, uh, 
a great deal of charisma. And they also came up with uh, material that resonated with people and maybe the timing was right uh, as well. Um, I, I don't know what the formula is for success of that, that sort. I really don't. I mean, you know, B Billy has more charisma than just about anybody I've ever, I've ever met, I've ever known. Um, and, and the same could be said, you know, with Ozzy and, 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 and all of these other stars. I mean, they, they just have this thing and it's just undeniable. Um, but I can't put it into words and I, I really. Well, what about for yourself then like your own success? Cause I mean, your resume is amazing. And I mean, even if you had worked with one of those guys, it would be like, that would be something you could hang your hat on for the rest of your life. But you've continually gotten gigs with Ozzy, Vince, Janie. And now you're, I mean, this, this group you're now at Last in Line is basically a super group. Um, so how do you continually get those gigs? I don't know. I mean, I, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a really, it, it's a very strange thing because, um, you know, I, I used to get this thing where people would say, you know, when, you know, what are you going to do when you made it? Or oh, that made it quote would come up. And I think to myself, made it. Jeez, I never really thought of made it as a as a as a goal. And what would that look like? What would that represent if I was to have made it? What would? And then, so I I, I remember at one point I sort of sort of um, sort of looked back as, at, at my own career, and I looked back at a, a long um, uh, period of, of of successes. And then I realized that uh, what I had done was quite uh, um, substantial. And I thought, wow, maybe I have made it, made it then. I mean, so my point was it's, that judgment is more of a retrospective thing. It's sort of at the end, you look back and you see all of these things that you've done, but never at any point during that time was I thinking, oh, well, this is what I'm going to have to do to make it, or this is how I'm going to know I've made it, or this is when I realize I've made it. It, that was never the case. It was definitely something where you look back and then you, huh. just, uh, you see a body of work that's that's gone on. And honestly, one thing to another, the things that have kept me going between projects uh, is, is the desire to do what I do. I mean, that's really the only thing I want to do. And so I keep on doing it. And even if it's, you know, there's been times when it's been really difficult and where, you know, other people might have questioned um, whether it's worth going on. Maybe it's time to, you know, go do something different or try something something else. It's just never an option. And for me, it's like, okay, if I can't if I can't work with somebody, then I'll write some solo material. If I can't do this, then I'll engineer something, I'll produce something, you know. But didn't you take a break where you were like fixing bikes or something? Like Yeah, would you hear that? <laughs> That's true. I got very frustrated at a certain point in time. I I, I just took a break. Actually when after I left Vince Neal's band. I was just kind of fed up with everything. And I just said, you know, maybe I just need to take a, a breather because I've been going nonstop since um, 1985 uh, when I sort of got the gig with Ozzy. And, uh, and it was 1992 and 1993 or something. And I just said, I've just been going nonstop. I just need to take a break. And I always love restoring motorcycles. I still do. It's something I was doing since I was about 14 or 15 years old. So I went to work for a friend of mine in, um, who, had, who restored vintage motorcycles. And I did that until after about eight months. I got fed up with it. <laughs> so the music, did the music pull you back or were you just sick of making yeah. fixing bikes? No, the music pulled me yeah. back. Sometimes, sometimes you can get very inspired by getting away from something for a while, especially huh. if you're immersed in it the whole time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I find myself uh, working on bikes and, and starting to come up with really great ideas. I'd go home and I'd start picking up instruments. And at a certain point in time, I said, okay, I think I'm ready to, you know, I've had a nice little hiatus. I'm going to get back to, uh, get back to work. So. Yeah. It's funny. It was the Vince Neil thing. I know. Cause I, I know it didn't work out, but I love that record. And like you wrote five or six of the songs. I remember even as a kid being disappointed when they said you left, I was like, Oh no. Cause like, I feel like you brought such like star power you know, being with Ozzy and then the songwriting, I was like, that was a big loss uh, for that band. band. Yeah, I put the whole band together for Vince. I mean, it was, uh, you know, his his manager at the time, uh, Bruce Bird uh, and Jack Blades called me up on the phone and they said, hey, 
Bruce who managed Night Ranger and he managed the uh, Damn Yankees and and he said I've got Vince here and you know we need you to put a band together he's your pal you guys have been friends for a long time and uh, why don't you come and you know do this with with Vince so I met up with him that same day and decided to put a help put a band together and we started writing and I did everything with that band and then uh, it, it went very sour. It went south. Um, Bruce unfortunately passed away um, one Halloween. He had a, an aneurysm. And Bruce was a wonderful guy. And he was the guy really holding it all together. And um, uh, a certain other a certain person in that band decided to start playing a bunch of shenanigans, and it just turned into a big mess. And at a certain point, I just I was like, okay, I got to get out of it. This is not this is not what I signed up for. Yeah, and that was well, another, too... reason, another reason why I sort of went off and worked on bikes. I was yeah, very frustrated. Take a break. Well, I'm glad you're back in the music. Uh, I'm loving the new record. Um, I'll let you get to your next interview. Um, I always end each episode promoting a charity, though. Is there? I know you've worked with Music Cares before. Is there something else you want to promote here at the end? No, I mean Music Cares is a, it's a great charity. They they took care of my friend Randy Castillo when he was dying, and mm. really really did a lot of wonderful things for him. And anything I can do for Music Cares, I always will. Yeah, I thought that was cool. I heard you say something about Randy, how, um, you know, he was kind of mad when you left Ozzy. And then uh, it, towards the end, he, he thought that told you that was a great decision because look at all these cool things that you had done. And he kind of thought like he should have done that. He didn't do as many cool things as you. Is it something like that? Yeah, I really felt bad when he said that to me because and not just because I felt vindicated for our earlier disagreements about this, but I, I, to me, the worst thing in the world is to have regrets about him. And that's what made me feel really sad. I mean, I think that, you know, I lived my life with the adage that it's better to regret the things you did do than to regret the things you didn't do. And so sometimes that's got me into trouble, but it makes me sad when I when people say something like that, say, you know, I really wish I'd done this and or I, I should have done this years ago, or whatever it was. So, um, and Randy was, uh, you know, he was my he was my close friend. I mean, for closer than anybody else um so i mean i think about him all the time so what music cares did for him uh is uh um is just uh was just wonderful and then so that anything i could do for the grammy for, for, for the music cares i'll do and also the other charity i support a lot is the paralyzed veterans of america you know so I, like i always try to do things for them as well um I have a lot of time for our military and for our veterans and for people who, um, you know, we bitch and moan because we've got to be somewhere at a certain time. These people get their marching orders and they're off 15 months. That's it. No questions. No ifs, hands or, hands or butts. But, 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 but. No, nope. they don't care. It's an incredible, incredible dedication. And uh, so, anyway. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'll put those links in the show notes along with the uh, the last in line website and then well you guys i can't remember was there i don't think there was tour dates scheduled or is there coming up yes we're working yes. on stuff for um april may and then in september afterwards so we had to kind of play around the death method schedules oh sure yeah so, okay that's okay that's what that's what we do <laughs> all right well thanks so much phil i'll let you get to the next one nice speaking with you all right bye-bye thank you bye-bye thank you to phil and thank you all for watching Check out the new Last in Line record, Jericho, out March 31st via Ear Music. You can support Phil by purchasing the record, streaming it, buying merch or a ticket to see a show, or even just following Phil or Last in Line on social media. And of course, you can support our show here by following us on social media. And of course, your comments, likes, and shares on both social media and YouTube with these episodes will help not only the show, but also the guests by bumping up in the algorithm so that more people will see it. Finally, uh, make sure that you're subscribed to the show wherever you watch or listen. I appreciate, appreciate all your support. Have a great day and shoot for the moon.